Hi, um, I'm Teresa. I'm the GIS and Map Librarian at IU Bloomington. Um, my co-presenter, Michelle Dalmau, who's the head of our Digital Collection Services, um, isn't able to be here today, but um, she is with us in spirit. Um, before I start, I want to clarify that here I'm talking about digitizing maps in the library sense of the word, as in scanning, creating metadata, preserving, making accessible, and not the cartography tracing sense of digitizing. I understand that's confusing. This is our title from the library grant. Um, so these maps, um, our collection is from about 1883 to 1947. If you were in Greg Miller's talk yesterday, um, he was talking about Soviet maps mostly from the later period. Um, a lot of ours are pre-Soviet um, and, and more Cold War maps. So ours are really interesting because they cover the area preceding and um, including World War II. Um, and I'll show you the extent of our collection in a little bit, and you'll see exactly why that's an important time frame for this collection. Um, Greg Miller also very kindly highlighted this collection in um, National Geographic's All Over the Map recently. Um, and it's kind of part of this larger conversation about Soviet maps that's been kicking around for a while. Um, our collection is also of a larger scale than a lot of other um, more contemporary, well, not contemporary, Soviet maps from like the 70s and 80s. Um, so ours are a lot more detailed. You can see the background of all these slides are little snapshots from our maps. Okay, so this is one of the very first maps I ever made, so please be kind um, about my index map. Um, and I know you can't really see it, but you're a cartographer, so I'll trust that you can recognize what part of the world this is generally. Um, so they're covering most of Eastern Europe, including um, along the border of what would later become the Soviet Union. Um, it also covers areas of the world that were extremely important during World War II, particularly Poland. Um, and a lot of the maps in our collection are um, of what's called in Russian area of state interest of Germany, um, but we typically call the general government in English, um, which is an area of Nazi-occupied Poland um, that existed from 1939 to 1945 um, and bordered the Soviet-controlled um, portion of Poland. Um, so really interesting and important part of the country. Um, it also includes kind of down in the, the bottom of the index map several sheets of Iran that border um, so the Caucasus region of the Soviet Union. Um, you'll also notice that there are quite a few gaps, blank spaces in this index map. Um, these are almost all captured maps, um, which means that necessarily there are some gaps in our collection. Um, we got these as duplicates from the Library of Congress through a cataloging agreement a couple decades ago. Um, so the Library of Congress may have a more complete set, but their collection's unprocessed. Um, we contacted them ahead of applying for this grant, um, and they kind of said, great, that's awesome, but we can't do anything about it now. Like, please go ahead. Um, so hopefully their collection will at one point be available as well. We might get a more complete picture. Okay, so again, um, this is a quote from Dr. Alex Kent, who um, is one of the co-authors of the Red Atlas book that we've been hearing a little bit about this conference. Um, he, along with um, Steven Siegel and Sarah Phillips, who's the head of our Russian Eastern European Institute at IU, um, wrote letters of support for the grant. Um, but his quote, I'm not gonna read it, just kind of reiterates the importance of this map collection and this period of time in this specific place. Um, these maps are of areas that saw incredible demographic um, and geographic shifts during the war. Um, and it's, as far as we know, one of the few collections that provides that really detailed pre-war landscape of Eastern Europe. So some ways we've seen scholars using these maps as research, um, a lot of it has been trying to locate historical places that no longer exist. Um, we've had around 80 reference emails um, since they first went live in 2014. Um, again, mostly it's people looking for small villages. My grandmother lived here in Belarus, um, but then I think it was Poland, and I'm pretty sure that the village no longer exists, but maybe it's on this map. Um, we've had some military historians looking at our collection, um, and interestingly, most of our reference collection or reference questions um, and hits to our database come from Russia and Ukraine. Um, 
from our usage stats, we discovered that on a Russian treasure hunting website, this was listed as a resource uh, to find great maps of this region. Um, and at one point, we were getting over 10,000 hits to our database monthly, um, which for our little library databases is um, pretty extraordinary. Um, we had a really sweet researcher who had been working with us trying to get some of these maps, and he was like, you know that people in Russia are downloading these, right? Like, they're using your maps. And we're like, yeah, we're a library. That's kind of our deal. It's fine. We don't want you to pay for them. OK. Um, so another really, really interesting and important part of the research in this collection and also why we were wanting to really um, digitize these in great detail are the stamps. Um, so I mentioned before these are captured maps. Um, they pass through many, many different institutions, governments, militaries, um, before we, making their way eventually to us in little Bloomington, Indiana. Um, but the stamps include places like University of Berlin. You can see this top left one um, has the a swastika on it. Um, it was during, obviously, the Nazi period in Germany. Um, we've got some from CIA map library, had these for a while. We think possibly um, British military intelligence. Um, some of them are stamped captured map. Army map service library had some of them. Um, so you can kind of trace by looking at these different stamps um, all the different places that they pass through. Um, so again, we're able to complete this project. It's a project we started, oh gosh, in like 2013 um, with wonderful unpaid interns. Um, so finally we were able to win this grant to finally kind of complete it. Um, I would love to stop talking about these maps at some point. Um, but this grant um, is from the Council of Library and Information Resources, or CLEAR. And the digitizing hidden special collections and archives, enabling new scholarship through increasing access to unique materials, is a really long grant name. <laughs> um, and it's um, a national grant for digitizing rare and unique content in collecting institutions. Um, it's supported by the Mellon Foundation, and um, it's a great program. All right, so I'll walk through kind of our process of what we're doing to make these accessible and discoverable. Um, we have a little over 4,000 maps, and again, in those three different scales, 1 to 25,000, 50, and 100. Um, we are scanning both sides of the map, um, and that's to capture that stamp information. Um, we're scanning at 600 DPI TIFFs, and I'll show this example probably at the end so you can see the detail. Of the map. I'll just show it now. We'll hop out. I trust that this will work. Okay, so here's an interactive view. Um, in our publicly accessible database. I know it's still small, but you can see um, that you can get some pretty good detail in these scans. Oh, it worked, good. Oh, um, the other thing I'll mention about our digitizing process, the Library of Congress um, included this plasticizing process on a lot of them. It was the 60s, and we were really into putting things in plastic in the US, um, which was great for keeping them preserved for the short term, but a lot of them are developing vinegar syndrome, so the plastic is slowly deteriorating, um, and with that, taking detail on the map. Um, so that added to the urgency of why we wanted to complete this project um, and finally get these preserved and digitized. So another big part of our project um, is creating the metadata for these maps. Um, they're really richly described. I know you can't see this field, but it's a snapshot of all of our different metadata fields. We're using kind of our own schema for this. Um, our main goal is to increase discoverability, so we're including information on the maps in the original Russian as it's printed on the map as well as an English translation. Um, sometimes there's also Ukrainian, Finnish, and other languages on these maps, so we're trying to preserve that as well as we can. Um, we're paying special attention to provenance. These are the stamps I mentioned, so we have our metadata specialists are transcribing the stamps as they appear on the map. 
Um, and we're also preserving the historical names of cities and then including what the current name of that city and country is. So the idea being that anyone could come and search for um, a historical name, um, or if they only know the modern place name, they might still be able to find the map they need. Um, we're also geo-referencing these um, with and without map callers. Um, we're creating geotiffs, and these will be available um, to download through Box. It's a pretty straightforward process for this crowd. I like not having to explain what that means. Um, oops. Okay, more about metadata. Um, we're also in including them in our IU Libraries Images Collections Online database. Um, like I mentioned, it can be searched in Russian or in English. Um, you can also do normal library database-y type things like browse by date. Um, there's some facets. You can exclude um, different scales. Um, and you can request the full-size image from this site as well. And that's where that interactive view was living. So our future plans for this collection, um, we'd like to update the index map um, and contribute to some uh, collaborative index mapping projects in the future. Um, we're also, if we have time and money left over, wanting to create a mosaic raster data, um, base layer of these maps. Um, and we're also sharing up to the Big Ten Academic Alliance GeoPortal project and um, the Digital Public Library of America, or DPLA. So now for the people who are actually doing the work on this project, um, we have a really great group of six undergrads and grad students, um, and then also myself and Michelle who are kind of managing the project. Um, Matt and Connor are two georeferencing specialists who are here today thanks to this grant. If you wanna raise your hands real quick, they are both fantastic and they are both on the job market, so someone please hire them. <laughs> And yeah, that's all I have. Anyone has questions? Yes. So, yeah. So the question was about our metadata scheme. Um, so the, I'm not the best person to answer that question. We worked with our map catalogers and metadata librarians to kind of develop it. Um, it so it's based on, our, on the, these are cataloged in LC, but only on the series level. Um, so it's kind of based on those general fields and then we just kind of added the ones that we needed to preserve the historical information. Um, so the way Image Collections Online works, it won't allow live hyperlinks. We're planning to add those from the index map, so you can link to the direct download. Yeah. Yes, Amber. Yeah. Uh, did, you, did you say you had a uh, guest here that was translated from some of the English that people could search? So we're using geonames to... Um, collect a lot of this information. So it's just part of our, um, the live database. Let me see if I can pull this up. Um, so it's just searchable here. Um, if you search for a place name and anything, it's, it's keyword searching really is the, the thing. Yes. So here's a, an example of what that looks like. So this is the original map, and then the back of the map, and then this is a geo-reference one, which is why it's wonky. Um, we started adding the geo-reference ones to here, but then realized that it would just look really confusing to everyone, um, and you still can't download directly from here, so that's why we, we moved them to box. We're hoping to find a more permanent solution for that at some point, um, but it's what we have for now. All right, thank you.